My name's Anne Chapman. I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of Greenhouse. Uh, we're a think tank that is uh, it's really about promoting debate and information and thinking about green issues. Uh, we're based in the UK. So this event, there's uh, two people from Greenhouse speaking and uh, two people from who, who aren't involved, who are experts on this area that we've invited to come along and uh, have their input as well. So uh, first of all, to, just to welcome you and to say that we are recording this event so that it can be made available afterwards to people that didn't manage to, to come along or you can have a look at it again. And um, oh yes, if you've got any questions or comments, if you could put them in the chat and then we're gonna have 10 minutes of each of four speakers and then have time for discussion afterwards. Uh, and at that point we could go through the questions in the chat. So we'll have all the speakers and then time for discussion. So I'd like to start off by introducing Jonathan Essex. Essex. He's got background in engineering, but he's also uh, been a councillor in Surrey for the Green Party for quite a few years. He's also been involved in Greenhouse for at least 10 years. Uh, prior to that, he worked for engineering consultants and contractors in the UK, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and has been involved in developing strategies for social enterprise eco park, promoting materials reuse, and in decarbonising the UK construction and housing industries. So he's going to say a little bit about uh, the overall uh, future of urbanisation and what the possible way ways forward are and the tra 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 trajectory that we are on and uh, what he thinks we ought to be on, how we need to change that tra trajectory. All right, Jonathan, hand over to you. Thank you very much, Anne, and welcome all. I hope you can hear what I'm saying. So future cities and, and what, what that might mean. So here we go. So, so this presentation assumes that the future has to be different from cities than it is today. That to deal with the climate crisis and other crises, we need to make some changes. And I'm focusing on two changes here. Firstly, how do we uh, make the changes needed in how we use building materials and how should cities plan for the climate emergency? But first, just an overview of, of the of the challenge we find ourselves in. Climate change is, is, the, is the main one that's talked about. And, and the main thing to note is the trajectory here is going up and it needs to shift to becoming down very quickly. But it's not just about climate change. I would pitch three other things we need to look at changing at the same time. Firstly, in the top left of this, um, poverty, uh, uh, the gap between the global north and the global south is increasing as well as increasing within many countries. Uh, it's not just about climate change, we need to look at other planetary boundaries, biodiversity. And it's not just about pollution, it's also about resource use. So the bottom of this slide looks at the change we need to make from a linear to a circular economy, and that applies to cities as well. And cities, where are we going now? Well, the main way we're going is up. This is a, a picture of flats in Beijing. China being the, uh, one of the main places where, where construction is spending carbon to make our cities and our urban environments bigger. And this is Chongqing, a city that didn't exist uh, a century ago, a city built from scratch on the banks, I think, of the Yellow River. And this is Dhaka, where I, I lived for around six months. And, and, and Dhaka is a good example of where cities are going with climate change. If we continue to expand the scale of our urban areas, in cities, many of these cities are in, are in areas which are at risk of flooding, both from rivers and also from sea level rise. So the challenge we have is that we are currently spending lots of materials, lots of construction materials in ways that lock in higher amounts of, of energy use, material use and carbon emissions in the future, which will then lock in the, the, the flooding of the very cities which we're building today. So the, 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 the idea that we continue to build in the places where we are building, using the materials and approaches that we use now, is locking ourselves in for a catastrophic uh, series of disasters, mainly in cities, in many places in the, in the future. So we need to decarbonize. We need to look at 
the difficult sectors that need to decarbonize and and cities are right in the center of this so uh, cement steel plastics uh, and, and then transport in terms of shipping aviation and heavy goods vehicles we need to rethink what we do in these areas if we are to create a zero carbon future and, and these areas steel cement and, and freight transport shipping and aviation are 30 percent that's three tenths of all of the carbon emissions globally so we can't continue to use these materials in the quantities we use today and expect us to get to a different future than the one we're currently heading in so two challenges how much should we use of what and and what what is the impact of that and you know how can we how can we make that differently so first of all looking at materials so from 1970 to today the amount of concrete we use globally is increased by a factor of 6.5 and steel by two and a half and that means that today concrete is eight to nine percent of global greenhouse gas emissions cement plus a bit more and steel including the effort to, to mine it the, the iron ore and the coal that used to make it is between seven and ten percent so just those two materials are, are, are around 20 percent of global carbon emissions and then, you know, the way we build cities, which, which encourages our economies to connect to other cities and other principal locations around the world, is driving the expansion of freight in the form of uh, heavy goods, vehicle shipping and aviation, which is a further 10% plus of global emissions. And that gets to the 30% I was mentioning before. This is the UK's construction footprint, roughly 60, 40, housing other. And if you look at the pie chart, which is at the bottom pie chart, that shows that roughly half of the materials are cement and steel and roughly the other the other half is everything else. So think about steel and cement and then double it. And that's that's the carbon footprint of construction, which we need to to rein in. And what does that look like for the UK? Um, 250 odd million tonnes of materials used every year to produce some 25 million tonnes of carbon emissions. And again, dominated by concrete and steel. So if, if we want to change what we do for cities going forward to deal with a climate emergency, we need to transform our material use. Now, steel is one thing. Steel in the UK, the amount of scrap steel we produce and the amount of blast furnace steel we, we, we produce each year are roughly the same. So we could, in the UK, create a, a much lower carbon steel. But concrete is more difficult. I, I welcome views of others in this in this session as to how we can get to zero carbon concrete at scale. You now, what are the alternatives or do we need to move our construction away from from, uh, you know, increasing the infrastructure and, and, and the, the type of structural buildings that require concrete and steel to rely more on things like bricks and, and more sort of natural building materials, um, which is going to re require a different form of, uh, of urban I, I mean, and you think of the uh, cities of the past quite often the look and the feel of a city will depend on the materials that can be surrounded uh, can, can be sourced from its hinterland um, as opposed to these standard choice materials concrete and steel which are used around the world um, some people talk of timber as an alternative to concrete bricks and steel um, but if we increase the amount of timber we use for for construction we're likely to increase the amount of deforestation um, we cause globally unless one of two things happen either we reduce drastically the amount of timber used in other areas which includes burning timber for biofuels or maybe we travel back in time about 20 or 30 years and plant more trees so we've got more trees to harvest here today and i think the latter one is a bit difficult so to deal with climate change we need, need to reduce demand for energy now this is the absolute zero report which i'd urge you to read from um, Allwood and Co at Cambridge University. But the critical thing here in terms of this discussion is it's just not the energy you, we use directly, but also the energy in the materials which we use. And, and that means that, you know, if we're going to accept this, if, if we are going to reduce the, the amount of carbon footprints, the amount of resource use and materials used for building cities, we need to shift. We can't continue to grow cities, infrastructure, industry, trade while seeing inequality and climate change increase. We need to have a different way, a different way forward. So I would argue that a different way forward is accepting first and foremost that our current approach of global cities, capital cities getting bigger, population growth focused on cities rather than towns and in rural areas has to be said that is enough. We need to shift our direction. So it's not so much the challenge set out in the new economy 
uh, new climate economy reports and others that you know new cities somehow need to be built in a compact rather than a sprawling way because most of the cities we're talking about exist already so this is London and how it's grown in the last century it's grown in scale it's grown in height it's grown uh, extent it, it's grown in the distances that we drag materials to it for for the lives of Londoners it, the, the ecological footprint for London is bigger than the land mass of the UK as a whole. So if we accept things are big enough, we, we accept maybe that as well as um, reaching peak fossil fuels, we need to reach also peak urbanisation uh, and, and peak infrastructure expansion and instead shift to, to build and plan in different ways. So I, I'm going to present you two brief planning scenarios, some work I did in Rwanda a number of years ago. Um, first, first of all, there was two different scenarios. One was the idea that we develop cities in that place with the idea that cities are crossroads and, and they, 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 they are hubs of inter international connectedness. We have infrastructure that links them to each other to maximise economic growth in an increasingly globalised world. Or the alternative approach is to see city as part of a region where a greater proportion of the urbanisation occurs in much smaller settlements, perhaps with those more traditional building materials within the catchment of smaller cities and, and in, in the smaller hamlets connected to and developing alongside the cities themselves. So the crossroads scenario is, is what we see today. It's, it's expansion of cities, capital cities in particular, making them bigger, linking them up with massive transport corridors. And it, it replicates the amount of energy and material use we have in in development today. You've got one minute, Jonathan. Uh, the alternative, oh, that we whizzed down, is to have more of a, a, a bioregional approach where we, we draw more of the food, more of the construction materials from around cities themselves. I'm struggling to move on the slides, here we go. And, and that means that we can focus on a vision, not so much replicating the whole world to that of the Europe or the US, but maybe looking at transition towns and interim countries uh, in terms of development like Cuba and Costa Rica for our hope. So rather than focusing on the future as somehow we need to build ourselves out of climate change, we should focus on demand reduction now. And, and, and that model from Rwanda is replicated in the UK in terms of visioning for cities here today. This, was, this report was published today um, from the Manchester Steady State Group on a city region scenario for Manchester. I draw on two of the policy areas that they are highlighting. So their vision for cities is not to expand, but to retrofit. And that's our priority. Create these 15 minute areas within cities, focus on repurposing buildings we already have, and focus on creating jobs in different places. So rather than housing being an industry of development, we need to think of the, 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 the process of development, the process of creating jobs to create a zero carbon future as the thing we most focus on first. So, so let's think of the materials to build the future as the people to do mm. the building, to do the retrofitting yeah. rather than building materials. Well, the work we did, yeah, the work we did in Greenhouse was it, a couple of years ago was saying, well, let's look at the jobs to create a zero carbon future. Let's look at where the population is in the UK. And we found the job creation is outside of those cities. So rather than expanding the cities, we can better use the houses, the, uh, the buildings that exist across the UK. So that gives us a very different for the vision, for the vision for the future and hopefully ones which we can all take a part in bringing about. Thank you very much. Right. So if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll come to them at the end after we've heard from everybody. So uh, now I'd like to introduce Maya D'Souza. Maya used to be um, in the core group of Greenhouse and she's currently on our advisory board. She works in public policy for the UK and has previously been a Green Party councillor in Camden where she, and uh, she currently chairs the Dartmouth Park Neighbourhood Forum there. Um, so, uh, but importantly, between 2015 and 2018, she lived in Hong Kong, uh, where she worked with businesses on collaborative environmental projects and um, reports on climate resilience, low emission transport, buildings, energy efficiency. And she's written a report for Greenhouse on this sort of draws on her experience of living in a city um, uh, like Hong Kong. Uh, called Urban Planning, the Hong Kong style, the high rise, high rise way. So that's available on the Greenhouse 
um, website and I'll put the link to it in the chat. So Maya, Maya's got a rather different vision or view of uh, the future of cities. Maya, would you like to start? Right. Yes, and evening everyone. Um, and thanks very much, Anne, for the introduction. Um, yeah, as Anne says, um, I'm going to be um, painting a slightly different picture of what uh, a world would look like or what cities could look like. Um, but just, just to say, when I was thinking about this world, I wasn't thinking about um, Manchester or London or, you know, all the cities that we know very well. I was thinking much more of um, countries which are in the process of urbanising and which may be doing so in, um, you know, not a very planned way. Um, but as Anne said, I used to be a Green Party councillor in Camden and I was um, on the planning committee and sort of quite involved in, in um, a lot of different, the, the King's Cross project was something that came up for planning permission early on. But um, later on as a councillor, there were quite a lot of developments proposed by, um, by the cabinet. And um, this is a Camden cabinet. And there were proposals for some high rise buildings and some sort of lower level um, housing estates. And just to say that when I first saw the proposals for the high rises, I was actually thinking we as Greens probably should really oppose these. Um, I began to think that we should be a little bit more open to um, the, the possibilities that uh, do emerge from high rise buildings, um, including from talking to some people living on an estate which had an option of high rise or lower level buildings. And in fact, the high rises seem potentially better in terms of not restricting views, not being a huge sort of um, monolithic block that affected a lot of the residents living there. So one of the reasons why I wrote this paper was to um, suggest that uh, a lot of green minded people should be thinking about um, how we design new developments in, in, a, in an open sort of way and not be completely, um, not be too rigid about it, not make too many assumptions at high rise. Um, developments don't work so that's where I'm coming from and now I'm going to quickly paint this picture of what um, high-rise cities could look like and why they may be a solution for a resilient um, and low carbon future so um, Anne if you could go to the next slide please um, so you sorry yeah so this is just the introduction slide with a little a nice picture of, of Hong Kong. Um, let's, um, so this is looking from the peak in Hong Kong Island. Um, right, so my proposition here is that um, the Hong Kong model is actually relevant to growing cities and it is um, something that we really need to think about and perhaps draw on because of the climate, nature and sort of wellbeing angles. Um, but I do recognise some of the challenges that Jonathan mentioned in terms of embodied carbon. Um, for developing countries, a stable power supply can also be an issue. Um, and also issues of social interaction, engagement. We all know in the UK that the experience of the big housing estates was not a complete success. And Becky Tunstall will tell, tell us a little bit more about those um, in her presentation. Um, well, I'm going to suggest that there are solutions to a lot of the problems um, as we get, as I continue through this presentation. Um, and I'll also draw out the relevance to the UK. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, just briefly, this is the sort of context that I'm looking at. Jonathan's already talked about it, so I don't really need to say much about it other than to um, and say that we do have, we still have continuing surprising populations globally, um, not so much in Europe, but we do have expectations of higher populations in the UK. Um, in, I'd say, a part of you know, Asia, Africa, people do expect better standards of living. So we have to try and work out how people um, can live in a way that is sort of better than they are at the moment, because 
a lot of people are living really on the margins of survival. It's it it is a very sort of difficult situation. Um, I'm, we don't plan and think through these sorts of possibilities. We could end up with um, uh, which is describe um, some of uh, the aspects of Hong Kong which um, are potential. And could we go to the next slide? So. Um, just some brief um, figures here to so that you know what I'm talking about. So Hong Kong um, in its very urbanized areas has about 24,000 persons per kilometer square. So that is very, uh, very dense. Um, other cities are as dense like places like, you know, Mumbai has a high, um, uh, high concentration of people. Hong Kong has a lot of green space, so once you look across the whole territory, it's not that um, dense. Um, the, what we call high density, low rise, something like Vauban in Freiburg is about um, 13,000 persons per square kilometer. Well in Garden City, something that is regarded as a bit of an exemplar, exemplar in terms of development here is much, much lower. We're talking about about 3,500 persons per square kilometre. So these are very different urban forms. Um, and just shifting to the next slide to give you a sense of what Hong Kong looks like. So um, when I was talking about planned development, um, this is what you can see here. Um, you probably, unless you know this territory, won't really know what, what this is showing but on the left hand side there's the big island Lantau mostly undeveloped except for one um, um, new town near the airport the small the island on the right hand side with a bit of grey around the top is actually Hong Kong Island so you can see that the development's concentrated on the top um, and a bit above is the north new territories showing the grey bit is um, the older bit of development, Kowloon, and then um, the green and purple bits are new developments. So there are these big new towns, including um, Chung Kwan which is the bit on the right hand side that I actually lived in. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a sense of what Hong Kong looks like. There's a large amount of that white space, which is um, Country Park. Um, and some of it's actually not shown on the map because I've managed to cut it off, but there's still more on the right hand side in what is Sai Kung. Um, okay, moving on to the next slide. Just very uh, About two brief. minutes, Maya. Okay, all right, I'm going to skip those slides and I'll just move on to the next one. So that slide just showed you a bit of what Hong Kong life is like. Let's look at um, the next slide. And please, rather than this one. Um, so, yeah, so despite it being very vertical, um, what you have uh, is not exactly what you may expect. Um, above street level, the podium level, uh, what's what's generally regarded as the podium level, you, you often have gardens. The, the top right hand side is actually something like a, a kitchen garden on a rooftop. Um, there's a lot of shared space. So people are living in um, small residential spaces, but with a lot of shared space. Um, there's a lot of walking, um, walking on different levels. You can cut from building, building quite easily on walkways. Um, it still has things like marketplaces. Um, other sort of elements of Hong Kong which have worked quite well, multiple use of public spaces, so like Science Park is a science park in the week and sort of public space with restaurants um, outside of that time. Um, there's lots of careful planning and um, wind modelling to um, ensure that the building, that, that the city still has a breeze and is livable and doesn't suffer from extreme heat island effects. Now I'm going to skim very quickly through the next slides. Um, so Anne, the next one. So in terms of the climate benefits, um, 
what's most important is um, with this sort of high rise compact development, it's very easy for people to use public transport. Um, public transport is profitable to use and construct. So it doesn't cost governments a huge, of money, a huge amount of money to do so. And you reduce concrete because of the reduced need for roads and other infrastructure. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, there are other environmental benefits, including um, space for nature and also um, space for water. So um, for cities that are affected uh, by flood risk, uh, it's important to ensure that there is space for water to go. Um, that In that picture, part of that blue space is actually a big reservoir. Um, so those are some other environment benefits, but I'm now going to uh, just mention some of the social benefits and then finish off with the challenges. And I, I think I may, uh, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. So um, in terms of social benefits, um, they are very much about short commute times, about nature and leisure space being close by. There is a lot of shared communal space with people doing everything from Tai Chi and lots of cycling routes and all sorts of things um, which are built uh, I suppose you know, because closer together it's easier to build things with a lot of fund and therefore um, you know the government goes ahead and spends the money. Um, but going on to the next slide, uh, as I mentioned before, there are challenges around embodied carbon, embodied energy. Um, there is potential, however, to use wood to some extent. Um, there are countries in the world who have, which have already been investing in a lot of timber production. Um, I'm not so sure if they can meet all the demand, as Jonathan said, that may be difficult, but um, there is uh, timber and we can go on planting it. Um, so we can we can start to plant a lot more now. Um, heat island effects can be reduced through planting trees, greens um, everywhere on tops of buildings, balconies, etc. Um, stability of energy supplies is going to be a problem in um, some countries, probably not in Europe, but in African parts of Asia that are still going to be an issue and could limit um, the height of the buildings. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, there are challenges in terms of um, community and crime, um, heritage. Um, I'm not going to focus on those, but to say that I think participation and democracy can be one of the big challenges. Um, if you only have owners of flats having a say in things like owners committees, as they do in Hong Kong, you are actually um, taking away a lot of the power that people would expect for their day-to-day -day lives. So if we're drawing on what happens in country in places like Hong Kong or you know Singapore, or we have to think about things like that. How do you actually govern these sorts of um, buildings? How do we get much more partis tenants participation? Can you, you wrap up now? Um, yeah. Okay. I, I'm going to wrap up. The last slide is really the the wrapping up slide. So um, yeah, these are some of the issues. Um, um, trying to uh, ensure we have the electricity we need for these sorts of um, cities. Um, if we are going to have low rise, high density uh, towns like Vauban or um, Welling Garden City, um, I still struggle as to exactly how we're going to do this. If we're going to have an aging population, um, how do you have four to five storey buildings with no lifts? These are challenges for us. Um, I know it may sound better to just refurbish buildings in existing cities, and I think that must be the answer to a large extent, absolutely. Um, but we um, still have to think about uh, that extra population and how people are going to be housed. Um, really important to look at trialing new materials. And um, just to stress again, finally, the strategic planning of cities um, is what I think is absolutely essential and what I saw in Hong Kong with transport, housing and employment all being looked at in the round. Um, so I think there's a lesson to be learned for all of us in thinking um, and planning our cities in that sort of integrated strategic way. Um, okay, thanks very much Anne.
Sorry, Thank you, Maya. So uh, now we're going to go to uh, Duncan Baker Brown. And uh, so he teaches at uh, the University of Brighton. He's a practicing architect as well as an academic and environmental activist and is the author of the Reuse Atlas Designer's Guide Towards a Circular Economy. Um, he has his own architectural practice, Baker Brown. And um, yes, and his 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 won numerous awards, including our IBA National Awards and a special award for the Stephen Lawrence Prize for the Brighton Waste House. And he's used the prize money from that to set up a student prize for circular closed loop design. So Duncan's going to tell us all about all these issues about design. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. OK. All right. Well, uh, wow, what presentation so far um, and what an interesting chat as well. Um, I'm going to whiz through my slides and I've just started my timer, so I will won't overrun. Hopefully we do live in interesting times. Uh, the COVID issue is the environment issue from my point of view. But yeah, we got this huge amount of infrastructure around the world, which is going to be used in a different way. So uh, reuse is the big deal. Uh, going back a couple of years, though, it, this is a positive thing. 2019 was the year that 90% of local authority regions committed to be in net zero calm by 2030. That's 60 million citizens in those regions, local authority officers running around trying to work out what to do to meet those very ambitious targets. Uh, some people have a plan. Uh, Amsterdam's got lots of plans, include, including the Donut City reference to Cape Rayworth's Donut Economics. Check it out if you don't know it. Uh, so what do we do next? Well, for a lot of people, it's can we afford it, which, um, yeah, I, we can hum and ha about that forever. Uh, some people don't have a clue. Uh, so why should we uh, be concerned? Well, there is no vaccine for the climate and ecological emergency. There's no quick fix. So why us in the construction sector? Um, this picks up on what's been said before, but, but basically uh, the built environment consumes 50% of all natural materials harvested and mined annually and creates 45% of carbon emissions. In the UK, we generate 200 million tonnes of waste a year. The, car, the construction sector does 60% of that. That's 120 million tonnes of resources going to landfill and incineration. So it's all about managing resources. And this is my thesis. And it's often designers and constructors that do that. We select the materials. We design things with materials and we say we want it to look like that and be made out of that. We need to understand the social, political, environmental issues that go along with that. The challenges are we exist as a linear economy. We are the only thing on planet Earth that does that. We turn up at a place, we uh, mine it, we rape and pillage it, we consume. And then when we've created a desert, we move on. Nothing else in, uh, in the natural world does that. Uh, we need to exist as the natural world. So we need to turn our linear systems into circular ones. And in a circular economy where humans are concerned, you've got two spheres. You've got the organic biosphere where you grow things, you make things out of those grown things, you use them, reuse them, reuse them. And then if you don't add toxins, you can actually, that those things can be, literally become food for new things to grow. However, we got the complexity of the tech sphere. So in a circular economy, old BMWs are source material for new BMWs, old cities are source material for new cities, or we adapt the cities we've got. So at the moment, BMW would tell you that 80% of the BMW is recyclable, but not into BMWs. We're a long way away. So some good news. Well, this is the good news last year. I mean, I'm talking from a UK point of view. The national uh, grid is greening, is cleaning, BP are divesting. It's all looking good. Even BlackRock are doing their bit. And some people have a plan. Uh, London's, the London plan's gone live again as a week or so ago. And part of that is the London's uh, circular economy route map for a number of sectors, including food and the construction sector. And I've been part of uh, a circular economy route map, which has just been published by uh, Brighton and Ho City. So, uh, yeah, we had a Tom Lyons from uh, the Green Party would be interested in that. We also, as an industry, I'm an architect, the RIBA has its 2030 climate challenge and the wonderful London Energy Transition in Initiative. And they're wonderful because it's a great document, the uh, Climate Emergency Design Guide. There is a consensus on an embodied and operational carbon descent plan. 
uh, i.e. whole life, life carbon descent plan across industry. And we have other across industry documents at the moment. So you've got the climate framework, which is defining some sense of climate literacy. What are the problems? How do we sort them out? And it's this cross industry action group, academics and people from industry. And there's gonna be one for the curricula, uh, for curriculum for teaching this stuff as well. People are talking outside their boxes. There's a consensus also that retrofit is really important. And there's a campaign for 0% VAT on net zero carbon development. Everybody's writing about it at the moment. This is good news because reuse is the big deal. 80% of today's built environment in the UK will be with us by 20, in 2050 when we need to be net zero carbon. So from my point of view, cities are the hope. There's a lot of chat about that at the moment tonight, but there's too many humans not to be in cities. We've got to make places at work. And I believe it will be competing city states and regions that give us hope, not governments preoccupied with 22 other big issues before they can think of the environment climate question. With over 50% of the world's population now residing in cities and over 80% in the UK, they are now the main driver for economic and system change and have the potential to power a successful circular economy. All the stuff arrives at cities, human and other resources, water, energy, you, you name it, it all arrives in the city. And for a lot of the time, it's just a linear outflow. We need to turn those cities into circular cities. The circular economy route map uh, published um, as part of the London plan by Elwab uh, outlines a vision of a capital city thriving for the, through the adoption of principles of a circular economy, an economy that keeps products, components and materials at their highest end value at all times. We don't down cycle anything, it's all up. We actually know what to do, that's the good news. I wrote a book about it called The Reuse Atlas, that's from 2017, subtitled A Designer's Guide Towards a Circular Economy. It's full of case studies of people dealing with recycling projects, which is the most basic dull thing to do, but then it gets more interesting. Step two is reuse. Step three is really clever, reduce. Don't use hardly any material. And step four is the holy grail of the circular systems. So recycling projects, interface to it nasty plastic carpet but it's ubiquitous as of this year 100% of the 100% of the source material for these material this product is waste material including fishing nets we're doing it at the university of brighton we're turning oyster shells into concrete tiles we we found one restaurant that throws away 50,000 oyster shells a year reusing is better because there isn't the carbon footprint and waste associated with it and urban mining searching for new materials on your doorstep is what it's all about. Cities are material stores for the future. The Brighton Waste House is a project I did which was testing that. But we were testing other ideas. It started out as we're, we'll just use construction waste or waste generated by construction sites because at the time for every five houses built, one house worth of waste went to landfill. But we opened up the brief a bit and started thinking about things that were thrown away by everybody. And this was the dumbest thing. 25,000 toothbrushes collected in only four days off aeroplanes landing at Gatwick Airport. But we also used other things like carpet tiles, which proved to be, have a really good fire, fire resistance. So you get a new sense of materiality. I'm not saying that we should use carpet tiles to cloud our buildings, but if you use secondhand materials from different sources, you get a different sense of materiality. This was us trying to quantify the 55 tons of materials that we have uh, stopped going to landfill in incineration. Oh, can't do my thing, Emma. There you go. And we've got ongoing projects, collecting duvets, testing the insulation, uh, qualities of duvets, not enough time to talk about it. Other people are doing it. This is the Lendiger Group in, um, in Denmark, cutting up 1960s buildings made of masonry where the mortar joint's stronger than masonry. Normally all you get is rubble. With the Lendiger Group, you get reused brick to make new buildings. That's not recycling, that's reuse, big difference. Rotor are doing it very well. They deconstruct buildings other people would just push over and they're distributing the material into the construction sector. So at the moment, they help part of the team deconstructing the World Trade Center in Brussels. These are unloved buildings that would normally get torn down every 20 years. They're only 19 years old, actually, and they're coming down, but they're already been redistributed into the construction sector. You can go online and order material on the uh, Rotor's uh, website. I'm working with them at the moment. And if you're interested, if you're a student or a grown up, uh, we're doing a digital school of reconstruction in August. Contact me if you want to know more, but we're literally deconstructing buildings and reassembling them. 
Step three is to reduce. These guys won the Prix de Prize last week, Lacaton and Vassalle. Uh, this will be the last thing I talk about. We need clever ideas. Uh, they knew that that tower block on the left was going to be demolished in Paris, residential tower block. And they went to the mayor and said, we can give you your new tower block, because that's what the deal was. We can give it to you for two thirds of cost. They didn't deconstruct, uh, demolish it. They just took the facade off and bolted on a new winter garden. The net result was what looked like a new tower. But that's the before and after. The real net result is the community wasn't dispersed because they stayed there, which is a big deal. Uh, that community that's uh, sheltered housing for older people uh, have 40% reduced energy bills. They have increased floor space, natural ventilation, natural light, great place to live. That's the before and after. And I'll end on this project, which is for me, there's a good, uh, it's a really good book called Wasted Cities. Um, and uh, it's got my waste house in it, but it's got lots of community initiatives around the sharing economy and uh, the, the idea of reuse and the solidarity fridge sums it up really. It's just a fridge plugged in, it's on a pavement. If you've got excess food, you put it in. If you're hungry, you take it out. And that's what the circular economy is all about in essence. So reuse is the big deal. Thank you very much. So we're now going to hear from uh, Professor Emeritus, Emeritus Professor Becky Tunstall. Uh, she's got an MA diploma in urban design and a PhD in social policy and administration. She was formerly uh, the Joseph Rowntree Professor of Housing Policy at the University of York. And uh, she researches on housing and social policy and has written a book called The Fall and Rise of Social Housing. So, Becky, you've got 10 minutes. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. And, and what three acts to follow? My goodness, we've got big problems, but we've got very big ideas. And we've also got some arguments going on about um, whether urbanisation is our friend or our enemy, whether densification is helpful, high rise can offer. So I'm going to take a slightly different tack. I'm going to um, look not, not so much at the future, but at the past and our very recent past um, to see what we can learn from that. Um, Maya, in her presentation, talked about um, British and, and Western European experience of high rise and high density living as being not a complete success. And I think that's true. Um, but then what is a complete success? And I think we need to bear in mind that our future solutions, which we're rushing for enthusiastically, will um, include a lot of frustrating moments and things going wrong and steps backwards as well as steps forward. So I think it's useful to look back just a little bit at, about um, at other attempts to, to deal with cities and the ways that we've been living. So I've been asked to look into the history of um, Western experience of high rise, high density living in contrast to what we've seen in Hong Kong. And there's a very long and varied history with different sorts of people, different buildings, contexts and experiences. And that means it's very difficult to generalize, but you need to look in detail to see what worked and, and what didn't. So a high rise building is one that really technically means you just find it difficult to walk up. So in, in British housing policy, that's been seen as um, needing to have a lift of five stories or more. Um, and if you're interested in densifying cities, um, high rise housing and high rise buildings in general are an option, but they're not the only option. Um, and they're not always very effective. Um, some high rise developments, uh, if you look at the whole site are not very high density. And there's been a lot of work, particularly since the 1970s on reducing low rise, high density residential developments. But just turning back the clock, um, the first high rise housing in the UK was at Harlow Newtown, a 10 floor block um, built in 1951. Um, the public sector took the lead in high rise housing um, and development peaked in the late 60s. And that was due to the Ronan, Ronan Point disaster, but also to basic economizing within the housing program. So there was a little quiet period in, in the 70s. Um, and then in the 1980s, the private sector started high rise building with the Cascades Tower um, that went up in Docklands. And jump forward to now, there are almost half a million high rise homes in England and they make up only 2% of total homes. 
Um, but when you look at the mixture, um, it's no longer authority housing. In fact, two thirds of today are in private tenures. So we've actually been living through um, a big period of change over the last two decades, um, and particularly in the last decade. Um, and it's been led by the private sector and by London and the other big cities. So over the last 10 years, the numbers of high rise homes, still small compared to the total, have jumped by 150,000. And it was nearly all private accommodation that went up. So that is a high rise in a nutshell. Um, but again, it's worth thinking about densification, which can occur by many other means than high rise. So uh, as previous speakers have said, overall British population density is going up slowly as the population increases. And when it comes to cities, after uh, decades of counter urbanization and de-densification in the cities, there was a turnaround starting in London from 1984 and followed by other cities from that time. And the big push by um, the Labour government over the 2000s to increase the density of development in new sites. And in 10 years in the 2000s, they got that density to jump from 25 homes a hectare to 43 homes a hectare. Of course, laughably undent by Hong Kong standards, but still a very dramatic change. Now, there has been a, a shift in policy or a gap in policy. An impact on, on development density um, stopped in 2013, rather symbolically. But overall, just looking back at that period, urban Britain has adapted reasonably well to this somewhat higher density living and um, renewal of high rise um, with a, you could call it a mini high rise boom. But are we at a turning point? Now, previous speakers have already said we've reached peak D. Um, I think we may arguably be at peak high rise. I'm not saying this is certainly happening, but there are important things going on. So of course, since the awful Grenfell Tower tragedy four years ago, um, thousands of high and mid-rise homes around the UK are blighted by worries about safety, insurance, mortgaging. And I would argue this isn't really an inherent problem of the building type. Um, it's a political problem, but nonetheless, it has dragged on for years already and will probably will continue to do so. And uh, as other speakers have already mentioned, COVID has meant a big jump in interest in less commuting, less dense working and living locations. We've yet to see how that's actually going to pan out because people, unfortunately, choose their housing and jobs under great constraints. And we'll just have to see what the new constraints are. But certainly um, there, there is more interest in less dense places to live. And um, looking at the, the issue of density as a means to help um, the country achieve its carbon targets and so on, it's probably been overtaken um, by a broader focus on, on all kinds of brilliant ideas like we've just heard about um, and retrofitting the existing housing stock rather than being so concerned about what the new stock would look like and how many floors it might have. But let's now just look back and see how successful Western high rise has been. Um, what, is, what is the story and what can we learn from it? I was asked to say, is it associated with social problems? And this is always a question that people want to know. And what's the answer? Well, yes and no. Um, Western high rise blocks have had social problems. And on average, I would say residents are more dis dissatisfied and there are more social, physical and management problems than average in high rise housing than low rise housing. But we all know that correlation is not causation. Um, we've had to spend this whole of the past year as amateur epidemiologists and amateur statisticians. So looking at the case of high rise housing, it's hard to say what's associated with the building type and what's with the, associated with the characteristics of the people who are living there, the poor or underfunded management they often have, the unpopular neighborhoods the buildings often get put into. And We've now got 60 years or more experience of high rise housing in the UK, so many different circumstances. So if you imagine back into the 1960s, a forced move by a vulnerable household to a poorly built new block as part of slum clearance is totally different to somebody choosing to move into a luxury block last year. There've been lots of good sociological studies 
even psychological studies asking people about high rise living from the 1950s onwards. Um, but most haven't been able to really get to this problem of separating the design from all the other factors that are going on and shaping residents' lives. Um, the two most famous studies that some of you may have come across, um, Oscar Newman's 1973 Defensible Space and Alice Coleman's 1985 uh, Utopia on Trial, um, were very influential um, in establishing in people's minds a link between design and social problems. But if you look closely, they're really not very helpful. They had methodological problems at the time, and we're in a completely different situation now. So I would say that overall, there's been a lot of research on problems and unsatisfied residents, but much less on successful high rise and happy residents. Um, and I think Maya probably came across many of those when she was in, in Hong Kong, although even in Hong Kong, the story is very diverse. What can we say about high rise? We can say that large blocks of flats, whether low or high rise, do have some distinctive issues. So physically, they have shared spaces between the, the street level and your front door. They have shared equipment like lifts, communal areas, rubbish removal systems. They have little or no outdoor space and they have a need to provide for emergency escape. So managing shared spaces and these equipment like lifts and so on takes money and management and this means that large blocks of flats whether high rise or not are always going to be hostage to political and economic fortune is there going to be that money and management in place to keep them going and to make sure they stay livable yes if they're amazingly valuable flats um, possibly in some of the most beautiful buildings in hong kong or london are going to be um, safe from the changing political and economic fortunes of their cities. But it's not like that for everyone. And let me give you an anecdote. Um, recently, I've been visiting a, a mixed tenure high rise development near where I live, delivering food to people shielding. Uh, there are separate entrances for the different tenures. And at the housing association entrance where I go in, the entry phone is always broken and the door is wide open and it looks very scruffy. A few meters away at the owner's entrance, there's a large lobby. It's like going into a fancy hotel. Uh, there's chandeliers hanging and the uniform concierge at the desk that I would be scared to speak to. So it's the same high rise design, same construction, same location, but very different funding and management and also different income levels and different household mixes amongst the groups of residents. And another anecdote, well, I, I live on the 10th floor of a tower block and it's great. So I'm one of the happy residents, except, except when the lift replacement went on for months and when the communal recycling bin can't cope. In other words, I'm happy as long as the block is well-funded and management and managed. And over the six or seven decades since the first high rise block went up in the UK, we haven't been able to ensure that blocks are well funded and managed. And I would argue that it is riskier to build high rise for people on lower incomes. And in, um, if you can't ensure a sort of nest egg for the, the building to protect it from these changes. So in my book, the, that was mentioned earlier, the fall and rise of social housing, I charted how social landlords have made formerly problematic high rise blocks work really well with investment. Um, you can change the designs in that brilliant example we just had from France, or more, um, you can apply more intensive management like concierges. Well, there've been some great cases of resident co-ops changing things around. Another option is to think about specific populations, such as older people, students or families without children who often take to high rise, high density living very well. But the challenge is finding ways to build in inalienable long term funding for management maintenance to make sure these buildings stay good in the long run. And so that in the future, if we build high density buildings, if we build large buildings, if we build high rise buildings, we won't look back and say, they weren't a complete success in a sort of ironic way, um, but we'll be able to say they mostly worked and there are a few things that we could still improve on.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Becky. Now we've got uh, about half an hour for for discussion. And I thought I'd try and sort of get us to, to think about, uh, you know, I've been through the chat and I think there's a, a four different sort of areas that we could talk about. One is the issue about urbanisation in general. And then secondly, specific comments about Hong Kong in particular and high rise. And then uh, the um, possible... Um, things about building design and whether we should be designing for repurposing buildings and finally the impact of COVID and what, what that's going to have on the future. So, uh, so just to start off with, we've got a few comments about, um, and I'm trying to find them now. Um, uh, yeah, so about urbanisation. So this is sort of the whole idea of urbanisation in general. So Jay Ginn, for example, says, should we embrace localization? instead of accepting urbanization with all its downsides and uh, what urban model is affordable in a nonsense free market economy like the one we live in so that was from Duncan actually so perhaps he can answer his uh, his his question there and uh, Peter Grinchinger sorry I'm not quite sure how to, to pronounce that is continuing urbanization really inevitable or desirable uh, move to urban areas is often caused by lack of opportunities and on lab grab, land grabs and other undesirable social developments. And I, in there, I would also put the crisis in agriculture and the uh, industrialised agriculture, which basically removes people from the land. And, you know, that that's something that you actually see all over the world. Perhaps it, it looks a bit different in different places, but you know, that is a big driver in urbanisation. And if we look to agriculture, perhaps we might be able to find some solutions to to uh, stop the, the continual drift to the cities and the pressure that puts on the cities. So I don't know whether uh, people would like to, to comment on that sort of issue, that addressing some of those questions. Would uh, Who would like to go first? Would, would Maya perhaps like to go first on all that? And then perhaps Jonathan. Okay, I think I'll start with that question on is urbanisation um, inevitable or necessary? Um, because I did spend some time sort of wondering and thinking about this. Um, should we perhaps be thinking we could sort of um, try and keep people in their villages and small towns? Um, so thinking about people in Africa, in Asia. Um, now, my feeling is that with two things, a um, the sort of environmental fragility created by climate change with drought um, um, in particular, but also flooding, etc. There are going to be real problems where people are just forced to, to move and where they're probably going to move to will be cities where there are jobs where it's sort of possible to you know to try and find it a niche um now my feeling is if we don't sort of plan for that you end up with the unplanned development which can become be worse in terms of a resilient future so i don't know the art i don't I, I don't know the answers to whether it is inevitable but i think to, in part it, it it is very likely and we should therefore plan for it um there are quite there are quite a few um some academics and others who would say that actually cities have been really really positive they bring people together they become a sort of hub of um thinking and learning and innovation um so i do think we should also recognize the benefits of cities and i noticed just to go back to the hong kong example um a city where people could get uh, around very quickly there was an amazing amount of sort of intellectual sort of um Bigger and there were just events every morning. You could go to an event at 8 30 in the morning for an hour really easily and then go into work. So everybody was constantly meeting um, and there were great conversations going on. But I hadn't, when I wrote, wrote any of that, anticipated COVID, which sort of begins to make you think, well, actually, perhaps it, it, 
isn't all as inevitable as, as all that. Um, but I still don't see poor people um, forced off the land um, that they will be able to find a job working on Zoom. Uh, so that's so that's that question. I may, I, and that sort of touched on COVID to some extent. I may just leave it at that at the moment. Um, and let's come in later with other things, with other thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan, yeah. would you like to say something on this issue? Let me have a go and then and then hand hand over for some hopefully more useful comments afterwards. Um, I mean, my perspective is is that urbanisation isn't inevitable. Urbanisation is is a ruse that's proposed by the neoliberal elite, um, and and that's mainly because about land values. If if you if you have a field and you have sheep on it or cows, and then you put houses on it, suddenly that land becomes really valuable. If you have a transport corridor and put houses on it, suddenly you can make loads and loads and loads of money. And it seems to be that there's a there's an agenda where putting built environment on our natural environment is a really good way to speculatively make an awful lot of money. Um, and I think that's the main driver of urbanization. That that's in the and and the um the, the way in which land is owned in rural areas, whether it's in England or around the world, and the constraints on people having access to land. Um, the, the idea that we can all move to a city without having a sustainable rural hinterland which supplies food is almost like shifting from economy which is grounded um, to one that's hung off sky hooks. And I think the best sky hooks you can think of in this context are probably called aeroplanes, because those are the things that link our, our cities together and, and, and connect us um, to each other in this global vision of a future. So I think we need to move away from this idea that we that we predict urbanization, we predict the need for more road space, uh, we, we predict um, what's going to happen where the economy is strongest and, and instead we need, to, instead of predicting, I think we need to plan. I think we need to plan for a different future and in in instead of the words inevitable, I would talk about innovation, creativity and, and change and, and that's about empowerment and about participation because I don't think we can have a plan from the top down that's going to be sustainable I think everyone needs to be involved um, so yes um, I think we need we need to embrace 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 localization and I think we need to to work at making where we live better rather than having a world where we expel people from where they've grown up and and force people to live in places where where they don't have those family links and those community ties Duncan, would you like to say something about this in particular, answering your question? Yeah, what own was question? my own question? <laughs> I'm just thinking about what's uh, just been said. I can't remember now. <laughs> no, I mean... I, I said... Yeah. Um, I'll try and find no, it's all it. right. I sort of remember. I, I mean, the, the, the issue is... It, you know, let's stick with the UK to, for, for, to make it simple for me, perhaps. The, the issue is that whatever model we come up, there's, you know, there's, a, the, there's a developer out there that's going to mon monetize it. So... Um, I'm not anti-urban, but I really do um, subscribe to what Jonathan's just said. And um, I, but I think what's interesting at the moment, one thing uh, that COVID's done to London is start to depopulize it. And you know, people that can afford it are, are leaving uh, or not coming back. And what's happened is that rent prices are going down already and people, are, and so it's becoming more affordable and people are already grabbing hold of those lower rates. So I think it's really interesting uh, when urban places become accessible to everybody and uh, there are very few models of that but uh, as an architect you know simply going across the channel when when we could uh, if you went to Germany or France we could see uh, accessible affordable model urban models which uh, you know for me were like utopia so but um, I would one 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 thing I would there's a book uh, which has a slightly uninspiring title, but I really would have a look at it. Benedict McDonald's Rebirding. It tells the story of how the the landscape in the rural landscape in the UK was sustained for a thousand years um, for a post uh, the Romans leaving, um, and how we just in the way we work the land, uh, everybody working it, it was a completely industrialized landscape supported by a biodiverse environment. We've got to make our rural uh, environments work. And uh, as Jonathan said, they can supply cities. But for me, we've got to make urban environments work because there's just too many of us to spread us out and just evenly over planet Earth. We've got to make rural places work and we've got to make cities work. I could, Becky, do you want to say something about this issue? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I agree. We we need to make places work for people. Um, I think having a debate about whether we're for or against cities is a bit of a dead letter because ninety percent of the population of the UK is urban, and more than half of the population of the entire world. Um, of course, I'm against people being forced to move into cities, but also I'm against them being moved out of cities. And in the UK, that that is a really big issue in some of the higher priced cities like London before COVID. Um, I think what we need to do is we need to try and make the cities that we have as, as socially and environmentally sustainable as possible. So it's about getting the right cities. Thank you. I'm just putting typing in the text at the moment. There's a, on this issue of the economics, the affordability of housing and all this sort of stuff, there's a good book here called Retha, I'll wave it at people and I'll write it in the chat in a minute. Rethinking the economics of land and housing, which is really, it sort of says that we live in a, our, our, our um, economic system. He calls it residential capitalism because in the UK, the house, the price of housing is so critical to the way the whole economy functions. So that's a really good one to think about the whole the more the problem about the affordability of housing because I think it has to be set in a wider context it's not simply a matter of whether we've got enough housing for the population we clearly have it's about the amount of money and whether people can afford it um, so just to move on uh, there's some questions that, about Hong Kong in particular and high-rise development and uh, so there was a link put in the chat to the cage housing in Hong Kong. I don't know whether you want to comment on that. I've had a quick, quick look at it. And it's about the very, very small, um, uh, it was a link at 631. So it's about the very small units of housing that you sometimes get in Hong Kong. And uh, saying, well, Hong Kong, you know, it's all the housing is unaffordable, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know whether Maya or perhaps Prashant, who I know also lived in Hong Kong, might like to comment on this. Well, maybe shall I, shall I just come in first? Maybe Prashant yeah. not to chip in. Um, um, there is uh, definitely, you know, this sort of issue of cage housing. Um, there's a lot of housing, though, that is very, um, you know, good quality social housing. So a large proportion of people do live in government provided social housing. It's something like um, around 40 percent of people. Um, and that may be small, but it's not like cage housing. They are sort of decent sized um, apartments. Um, but there's no denying it that there are still there is still pressure on the land and still difficult for everybody to get the right size accommodation. I think Hong Kong could do with regulating the size of things like bedrooms in buildings, um, and that could make um, it even more livable. But I'm not going to suggest that Hong Kong has sorted the sort of scarcity problem in terms of housing. Um, and they do something about what Jonathan was talking about. There is a bit of rationing of land space for development. Um, and by uh, the government, in fact, earns a lot of its sort of taxation revenue um, from um, a land tax. So when they sell land off for development, they do it at a very high, um, they, they get a, a, a high amount of revenue for the government. So the rationing does have a benefit in terms of um, raising funds for the government. Um, so good things, but it's not it, definitely not perfect. And just to, yeah. Yeah, just add a small point to what Maya says, which I totally agree with. Um, Hong Kong is a really weird situation where uh, the average size of social housing is actually bigger than the average size of uh, some of the sort of smaller private sector housing. Um, and it's really to do with the, the behavior of the private land developers who have tended to uh, try to keep the prices high by, um, even when they have um, you know, lots a lot allocated to them by the public uh, process, or they have brownfield sites, they choose not to develop it because they want to uh, keep the prices up. So it's not, it's not quite endemic in, high density, it's the way that the high density is is kind of merged with um, the kind of, the, well, let's say the greed of the developers, and plus the deregist de kind of way that Hong Kong is governed. So and it's really peculiar that, you know, Ryan and I were living there, that um, 
the, standard, the standard size for the public housing, which was set by governments, was actually bigger than the kind of the minimum sizes of the private sector. And that's why you get these problems like cage houses and stuff, which are absolutely horrible. And they, they do exist, they are true. Okay, so we've got a few more comments about the uh, design and some uh, comment about Park Hill, that it was successful until still workers losing their jobs. So that's about, perhaps it's not just about the design of the uh, the building, but also who lives it, in it and the social mix and things. And how to ensure healthy generations, etc. And... Um, yeah, how to ensure there's quality outdoor space. Do you want to say something about all that, Becky? Sure, yeah. Park Hill is a very interesting example. It's a high-rise modernist estate built in Sheffield that went through some good times and bad times and has now been refurbished mainly for a different market. Um, I, as a housing person, I, I, I get very frustrated with fellow housing people who are always telling policymakers that um, if only they did something slightly different in housing, we could solve a lot of social problems. Um, a lot of the problems that we think are housing problems are really labor market problems. They're about people not having secure enough, um, substantial enough incomes to pay for decent quality housing. And, and the, the, co the collapse of some of the big industries in the 1980s is one of those sorts of issues. But I think it's worth bearing in mind that the, the economic transformations we're hoping will occur to meet the carbon targets are going to have really big impacts too. There will be job creation, but there will be job losses in the steel industry somewhere in the world and the cement industry, if all goes well, um, and they will have local impacts and they will affect local housing markets. So we need to think about the housing consequences of our um, environmental policies as well. Thank you. So then there's a few questions about uh, building for repurposing and the building design. Uh, I'll just try and find that comment. Question, In terms of lean design is that if you actually build um, out of concrete, you have a concrete floor plate across between the walls. And if you actually, with concrete, it doesn't really matter once you've built it, um, whereas if you've got an air system like an aircraft wing, every bit of weight matters and you could actually use, you could actually feather off the concrete so it became narrower where you didn't need as much strength. So you can actually use much less resources to out here, to 20 or 30% less steel and concrete in the building because as you get to the top, the steels can be smaller, but practically speaking, it's a lot cheaper. Well, it's not cheaper, it's easier to build you know, the bog standard way and in Bristol you know the University of West of England they've just built a new engineering um, faculty building and it doesn't actually demonstrate what they should be teaching their students the classic thing is you ought to you know um, if you say do as I say and uh, say well why should we not do as you do you know if the, if the academic if the university decides that it's cost engineered rather resource engineered you, know, you can't teach your students resource engineering if you yourselves as the uni cost engineer you want to say something about that, Duncan? I do. Uh, there's a lot of people that know what they're doing at the University of West of England. Is that where you said it was? Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. And uh, I mean, be, you know, I, t I, I taught sustainability for 25 years and uh, we've got a pile of stuff being built outside the School of Architecture at the moment in Brighton. And I point to it and just have to say that's how not to do it. It's uh, in situ <laughs> casts, uh, concrete frames being constructed with to, uh, 15 story high buildings for student apartments, et cetera, or student uh, residential, residential accommodation. And it's appalling from the point of view of construction systems. Um, and uh, that, that's why I'm slightly heartened that um, I've been part of the team that have now brought out the circular economy route map for the construction sector in Brighton, because you just won't be able to do that anymore. We've got to stop pouring concrete above ground whenever we can, because you know, if you're going to invest in carbon, you've got to make sure it's something that can be deconstructed and reused again and again. And uh, all that concrete cast above ground uh, in situ is uh, is not a good idea. Uh, the sort of fine tuning of the design you're talking about is is the beginnings of good practice. Um, but you know, there's options to uh, mass poured concrete above ground, timber being one of them. But if you're going to use concrete, make sure it can be uh, reused for a thousand years at least, because of the investment in carbon you've made and resources you've made in the first place. 
but yeah, it's so frustrating that you know the University of Western England has some real leading experts around this. Um, and uh, yeah, to watch that sort of building being constructed must be frustrating for them as well. Yeah, thank you. And there's there's another comment about the need to to uh, make build design buildings so they can be reused for different uses, repurposed afterwards. Yeah, yeah I mean, designing yeah. buildings as material banks for the future. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, for example, I the house that uh, I live in is actually designed to be convertible into three one bedroom flats, which is interesting. <laughs> it has all sorts of. Uh, you know, like we've got two staircases, which is a bit odd and Ooh. takes up a bit of space. So it's not one to go up and one to go down. <laughs> it's great for kids because they can run around in circles. But um, uh, Jonathan wants to say something. And then I want to get on to um, uh, people thinking about whether COVID and what the future for uh, cities and things is with COVID, like whether we can repurpose the, the centers of cities and without so many people going in every day to, for, to big offices. Uh, but Jonathan, first of all. I, I just wanted to, to respond to Mark's question by commenting on concrete more than anything else. And, and if uh, I'll stick a thing in the chat in a minute, um, the Chatham House have done a research recently called Making Concrete Change. And I think that's what we really need to do. And, and what, what they say is if we continue current pro predictions in terms of urbanization, economic growth and population growth globally will increase from four to five billion tonnes of cement a year. And if developing countries replicate the current infrastructure patterns here, that will mean that 470 gigatons of CO2 by 2050 are from the construction industry. Now, other research says that the limit which we have for a 50% chance of avoiding uh, the, the, the 1.5 degree warming that's considered to be dangerous climate change is 440 gigatons of CO2. So that means the construction industry alone, if it continues to use anything like the current material mix, the current amounts of concrete and steel, the current process of urbanization development globally, will without any other emissions from any other sectors, no planes, no ships, no agriculture, no materials bought or made would cause runaway climate change. So that's the scale of challenge we have. So I, I would think that we, we need to look upon what Duncan said and, and, and look at everything we've built now, everything that's built now is the resources from which we can build our future. We can't continue to use new amounts of concrete or steel. We need to stop burning clay to make rock called bricks, burning limestone to make rock called cement and burning iron ore to make iron to make steel unless we do that we are you know to hell in a handcart and everything else we talk about is window dressing thank you jonathan so i wonder whether we can move on to just thinking about addressing some of the comments about covid so there's one from tom lines uh, so, you know, pointing out the the trends towards home working online and therefore, you know, what's going to be the future for the city centres? I mean, personally, I feel it's a bit too early to say what's going to happen. And, you know, we're sort of a year into it and, and another year we might find out what the future is going to be. But I don't know whether people want to comment on this. Uh, Duncan. Yeah, I, I well said actually, Anne. I think it is it is a bit early, but there is a rush of ideas out there, and uh, I think I, I just referred to lowering rents in in uh, residential rents and of course commercial rents in London, and so I I think there's going to be a, there is going to be a rush um, to do things. I mean, I'm currently working on a project for a, a school to uh, occupy Debenham, so you know there's there's that's there's a lot when when we do open up again, there's going to be a lot of voids there, a lot of big bits of infrastructure that are empty. So the way they, and the rents will plummet and then they'll be occupied. So uh, it's a bit like, a, you know, a, a, the normal sequence on a, a development site, so-called in less uh, attractive places where, you know, you, uh, artists and what have you start to occupy uh, shabby parts of town and create a sense of buzz and community and then in a way that gets the place going and the developers move in again so we might just sort of be watching a an inevitable cycle but I'm not sure we will ever occupy say the city of London if we talk parochially uh, the way it was occupied up until a year ago 
Um, and uh, you know that, that is interesting. It's really interesting that um, you know they are huge. They're currently an application for huge office development in the city of London, right next to the Bank of England. Uh, massive. And is that going to be built? Who's going to be in it? I mean, it's surrounded by empty tower blocks. So um, the reappropriation of that infrastructure is really exciting from my point of view because it's really you know COVID's disrupting things. Uh, yeah. I think it's positive. Uh, well, the people like to, I think the danger is that we, uh, you know, with the toys allowing just uh, conversion of offices into homes with very little controls that we have really low quality uh, accommodation. Yeah. And that's the problem that we need to avoid. Yeah. Uh, Becky or Maya, do you want to say something about this? Just, just very briefly. And I'm with you that it's too early to say. I think there are going to be quite a lot of contradictory movements. So people moving out of towns, other people moving into vacated retail and office or cheaper accommodation. And it's going to be very different in different size towns around the UK and around the world. Yeah, well, just to add to that, I think it may be a bit too early to say, but... I would quite like to see government actually encouraging that sort of repurposing of the city of city centres into residential space. Uh, to me, this is a great opportunity to turn those city centres into mixed use spaces and have these sort of vibrant town city centres again. So London, City of London, what it used to be in sort of whatever, the 17th century, a place where people lived and worked. Um, and I've seen a few signs of that already when you cycle in these days, so people not living there, but over the weekend, they're now using the squares and all those spaces that would have been pretty much abandoned and deserted. Um, so I think a lot of potential on the repurposing front. Uh, any other final comments from the speakers? Jonathan, I'll let yeah, you have the last on, word. Uh, just on this, on on the current office to residential conversions, it's done under permitted development, as Anne said. So the first thing I think we need to do is to bring that into planning. So we need to require that that refurbishment to be brought to zero carbon and we need to provide the affordable homes. And, and then in terms of the opportunity, I think that we should take upon that some of the changes under COVID as an opportunity. And, 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 and firstly, ha houses. I've spent more time at home. I'm sure many other people have done as well. And, and that highlights the importance of retrofitting the homes we live in. And I think we should really push the government to, to fund retrofit and to plan retrofit on a street by street basis. The other, the other side of it is transport. Um, you know, half the steel in the UK roughly goes into making vehicles, and the other half to making buildings, half the concrete into infrastructure and half into structure. So transport is critical in terms of construction materials, but it's also an opportunity for change. And if we if we reduce the number of cars, that's a different way of having more, more density in the urban spaces. But, but that, that change in terms of how we move around to low traffic neighbourhoods, the, the change to retrofit our homes, I think these are things that can happen after COVID, but it requires a planned approach and it requires intervention. Yes, and, and the nation needs a big social investment. It needs investment in the social infrastructure, childcare, care, education, all the things that people have missed out on. And those don't use nearly so much concrete and steel as the physical investments that have dominated in the budget. And those, those social investments will be much more pro the environment. Mm -hmm. So we need really big change. We need really big change on what, what's, what will happen unless we do something about it. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for taking part in this and for engaging the chat and, um, you know, listening to the speakers and the speakers for all their co their great contributions. There's the green on the Greenhouse website, you can find Maya's report about Hong Kong and uh, there's information about um, well, Jonathan's written various reports says if you go to the climate emergency economy page. There's uh, recent reports that he's done about steel and cement and that sort of stuff. And also he's written a chapter in our book, Facing Up to Climate Reality, that was published um, a couple of years ago now, doesn't seem that long. And I put a link to where you can sign up to the Greenhouse newsletter if you want to hear about future events, if you don't get that already. And 
So thank you very much for coming. We will make the recording available on the website and all that. Thank you.